from the start. So, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, Thursday uh, session of our seminar series. So, before I introduce the speaker, so I just want to remind everyone so next week is quite special. So, we have the INI dreams of activity going on. So, we'll have two special talks morning, uh, Monday and uh, Tuesday, 9 a.m. Uh, so the first talk will be by Kenadiel, uh, and uh, the second talk on Monday, the second talk on Tuesday will be by Christopher Malcolm from, uh, I guess, will, will be Vince. So, and, uh, and then refreshment the very much will be provided. So we provide the uh, recording. So, uh, yes. And then we will have one seminar uh, as, as part of our series on Wednesday. So let me speak on Wednesday. As we are October, we will be our streets before the days will be circulated shortly. So then, happy to introduce the speaker today. So, Marisa Kalini from the College of Charleston, South Carolina, University of America. And uh, she, Marisa, has made lots of contributions to the theory of the systems in the place, in particular in the community method, the methodology study of particular conditions, problems, and their connections with topology, geometry, both experiments, meaning of the score, and provided a close and complete list of these uh, contributions. So today, we have a very nice, unique title, Solid Equations and Geometric Flows. We're looking forward to the talk. Thank you, Antonio, for the lavish introduction. <laughs> and uh, thank you to all the organizers of this talk. My last year, a few weeks ago, uh, and I'm, I'm very enjoying it. Um, so, thank you, guys. Uh, so, uh, I, I probably will not mention fluids, <laughs> but I will mention flows. Uh, so it's a little bit off topic in the context of like hydrodynamic, although the first uh, example I will bring up uh, is, of course, the vortex filament equation as an example of Jupiter. So uh, there will be several examples, some of it uh, maybe foreign and uh, a bit technical, uh, but uh, I will start with the uh, really what I would like to, uh, you to take home uh, from this talk. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll uh, uh, look at the connection between uh, so-called moving frames and integrability. I will show you how the KDD equation uh, arises in the context of geometric flows. And uh, in the last part, I will talk about more recent work with uh, uh, Gloria Maribeth on the split settings. By the way, the two main collaborators uh, for, uh, the work uh, presented in this talk is Tom Ives and my very long-term collaboration at my institution. Uh, and uh, over the last 10, 12 years, we uh, started uh, collaborating in various ways with Gloria Maribefa at the University of Wisconsin, who is uh, an expert in what's on So um, what are the take on points? So what, first of all, um, uh, what is a geometric flow? So you can think of a geometric flow as an evolution of an object. Uh, it can be a curve, it can be a surface uh, in a manifold M uh, that is invariant under a certain group of symmetries. And uh, uh, when this object evolves, uh, I will focus on curves and particles. Uh, we call a geometric flow integrable when the evolution of the curvatures of geometric invariants are integrable evolution. So it's a, it's a little bit of a, a, a definition inherited from the flow on the on scalar quantities that are typically curvature torsion. And in your setting, this would be the wave equation, the solution of your uh, nonlinear units. Now, very famous case here uh, is the vortex filament equation. Uh, which uh, geometrically you could think uh, of the binormal flow, uh, the velocity field of a curve in space. Uh, let's say that these axes are the length parameter. 
it's proportional to the binormal of the curve. So it lifts up it's also the vertical plane and, and is stronger when the curvature is uh, higher. So uh, this equation maps into the uh, as a model uh, into the nonlinear uh, Schrodinger equation to a map that uh, packages the curvature and torsion of the evolving curve in three space uh, into a complex potential, and this is what you guys studied the solution of this. And so, in that sense. Uh, this geometric flow is integrable because the associated uh, PD for the geometric invariance, curvature and torsion, which you don't see here yet, we will see soon, uh, is an integrable PD. Um, now, um, when we get to these invariant moving frames, invariant means invariant under the group action uh, of the corresponding uh, uh, geometry. Um, it looks like uh, the moving frames are actually key to integrability. And I'll show you how this integral equation uh, arises uh, using uh, the two of moving frames and also uh, some preservation, typically of the lowest order invariant, uh, of length So these two ingredients seem to be key. Uh, uh, you see two examples, uh, it's not entirely understood. And the last point I want to make is that sometimes uh, when you uh, look at the geometric pictures, uh, things may be simpler uh, than the picture at the level of the invariance. And uh, uh, the last example I will show will be a kind of a strong example of uh, this last point. So, uh, moving frames and integrability. So, the, the canonical example that I want to start with uh, is actually the example of uh, uh, the classical frame, frame of a space curve. So, a curve in three space. So, so um, as you know, uh, there is a, this orthonormal triple tangent, unit tangent, if the curve is parameterized by arc length, uh, normal and binormal, they're all. With vectors. Uh, and they form an adapted frame in the sense that uh, uh, the frame will satisfy uh, a set of bodies as is like the, along the curve. Now, notice that the coefficients of the right hand side in these ODEs, uh, which I call kappa and tau uh, for Rene theory, uh, they represent the curvature and the torsion of the curve. So they are responsible for determining the shape up to uh, rigid motion. Now the underlying group here is the Euclidean group, so it's rotations and translations. So if I give you curvature and torsion, I can reconstruct a curve up to an element of the underlying symmetry. Now, of course, these are not the only frames. Uh, what you could do is uh, uh, literally rotate N and B in the normal plane. And uh, uh, sometimes these sort of new frames, uh, denoted with T, with one, with two, uh, are indeed more natural. They're called natural frame systems. Uh, maybe at the simplest, in the simplest form, uh, try to set this constant sigma. This is called uh, a rotation constant. It tells you how much I rotated and uh, within this normal plane. Set it equal to zero. And uh, uh, the uh, frames on this rotation, known as parallel frame, are called in this way because U1 and U2, uh, as you, the, 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 the derivative of U1 and U2 are parallel to the curve at each point, again, in the case of sigma equals. So if you change the representation, change really the frame, uh, what you are getting is uh, uh, as a bonus. Uh, they so called asymptotic transformation. So the K1 and K2 here are the new invariants. They're not really the geometric invariant K and tau. Uh, they are uh, a, a, a transformation involving kappa and uh, the antiderivative reduction. And uh, uh, you, some of you will recognize in here uh, the asymptotic method. Yeah, we'll discuss that in a second. 
that uh, links uh, the uh, curve evolution and the, the curve uh, description and the uh, NLS equation uh, in a certain way. And this is from the beginning of science, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it, this is known around 70, 74, when actually integrable systems were developing. So uh, the way we see more of this connection to the VFE is by um, representing every frame as a matrix in SU2, a skewer emission matrix, um, with respect to a certain basis. I take the Pauli matrix here that are uh, skewer emission. They form an orthonormal triplet. Uh, the underlying group here now becomes uh, the spatial unitary group. It has a transit on every triple. And therefore, you can always, let's say, rotate uh, the Pauli matrices uh, to uh, any orthonormal tree. So when I do that, what I'm saying is that there will exist an element of the group that conjugates each Pauli matrix, each power matrix is to your desired uh, element of your orthonormal tree. When you do that, and you insert uh, your expressions for uh, E, one, you do in terms of omega into the uh, natural frame system, what you're getting is an ODE um, for the matrix omega, which is in the group. And of course, this object, if you calculate, lives in the Lie algebra, lives in the matrices that are emission. Now, again, if you represent this uh, uh, right-hand side and you call Q, a half of kappa one plus i kappa two, what I showed you before, you should recognize immediately that what comes out here is the uh, spatial part of the eigenvalue problem of the so called AKS. So it's really half of the lax pair for NLS. And this parameter sigma, the rotation parameter, ends up being related to the spectral part. So all I'm showing you here is a different way of describing the frenetic issues. Instead of describing it uh, in the setting of SO3, I'm describing it in the setting of the uh, legal test. And so what you see here in disguise are uh, the uh, frenetic equations, but the natural. So now you know what game I am going to play. I have uh, my uh, equation for a moving frame, and I am going to adjoin a compatible evolution of the frame. And uh, the compatible evolution will simply say that uh, uh, omega is going to uh, evolve with respect to a second independent variable. Time uh, will, be, uh, it will be interpreted as time. Uh, according to uh, a second uh, linear system where this matrix lies in the, uh, the algebra whenever lambda is real. Now, compatible, of course, means uh, there is a zero curvature condition uh, that uh, you all know, and that we want this to be independent of the spectral part. Lisa, how yeah. the spectral part lambda? The devices in and a very good question. So I will mention this and we mention a possible resolution on how to introduce the spectral parameter. But in this case, for the DFE, notice the spectral parameter is really related to uh, the sigma in selecting this natural frame. So it's really, in some sense, a selection of frame. Uh, there are more rigorous ways of somehow arguing how to uh, introduce a spectral parameter, but uh, accept this for now, and then I will discuss it uh, later. So you allow K1 and K2 to be dependent on the uh, No, this. K1 and K2 are, are going to be independent on lambda. On lambda. On, uh, on lambda, yes. But they yes. depend on S. Uh, but they will depend on X and So in sigma is not. Yes. So the coefficients of these uh, uh, matrices 
are going to be dependent on kappa and tau, in this case, or kappa one, kappa two. They depend on S and T, but they won't depend. So it's, it's, the, it's the usual uh, last figure of the integral mobility. All right, so uh, for the vortex filament, that's the uh, uh, compatible evolution that I start with. The long, of course, I am here done. Uh, if you write down the compatibility, you get uh, uh, the MLS equation, the focusing type. And uh, uh, also, uh, if you uh, look at the evolution in terms of the U1 and U2, again, you recover the binomial. And uh, here, 1972, Azimoto, Azimoto map, and here is the production. So, so in some sense, uh, what you could say is that the uh, vortex filament equation is a, a Euclidean realization of the LMS equation. So the, real, the geometry flow, which is defined. Now, um, just to flash a slide, there is a lot to say about uh, the DFT, but I want to just point out uh, a couple of things. So, uh, because the DFT and the MLS are, are basically paired in this way, uh, it turns out that the various structures uh, that underline uh, integrability, in particular by Hamiltonian structure, are related. But all I want to point out is look how simple the structure is at the curve level. And in a sense, uh, how more complicated it is at the level of the invariance, at the NLS level. Uh, the two symplectic operators here at the DST level are really simple. One is rotation by 90 degrees in the normal plane. No surprise, this is multiplication by x, same for the NLS. But the second operator is essentially uh, differentiation. And this seems to be kind of universal in many ways. Uh, the J is gain, you rotate, you differentiate, you rotate back. And uh, this operator is equal in, in, in evolution, right? This J squared is fine with the identity. Now, the recursion operator is also super simple and is local. This is all local, right? Uh, this is non local. And so, when you are uh, doing this business of uh, uh, building recursion operators, uh, you have to, you know, you have to uh, find a little bit to be this integral. So, so the picture here is, is in a sense, clean. now, uh, more than that, uh, there is a, a very nice work by Langer and Perlein, again, early work from the late 80s, uh, that uh, uh, look uh, in depth into the Asimoto map. If you take the differential of the Azimoto transformation, uh, that takes uh, vector fields to vector fields, right? Vector fields at the level of the space of curves to vector fields at the level of the NLS. Uh, those vector fields are somewhat special because we have to require our land reservation. So beta one, beta two are free uh, functions uh, of X and T of S and space and time. This alpha is uh, prescribed uh, because W has to preserve the length of the unit vector. So you have some condition. But under this condition, uh, the theorem says that this map actually takes the uh, fluid, the, the classical mass, the Weinstein Poisson structure for fluid flows to the fourth Poisson structure for the NLS. So it really preserves Poisson structure with the shift. And so the Asimoto map is actually a, a very nice map that sends the Poisson uh, system to another Poisson system. It doesn't, it doesn't kill uh, integral. So in that sense, we are, it's legitimate to talk about uh, uh, the DFD is integrable because uh, the evolution of its invariant is an integral. So integrability is not broken by this correspondence. It's uh, maintained. All right, and now you will all ask, uh, what, is, what about the KDB equation? The KDB equation is a, is a nice story, actually, uh, because uh, in the 90s, I believe in 1995, um, Ulrich Pinkau at uh, Team Berlin uh, is very famous for writing really short paper, but really intriguing papers. So you read one of those papers, you want to work on, on that immediately. So um, uh, first, let me start with the definition. So you have a smooth curve. Uh, now we are in the plane. And uh, I'm going to consider um, 
uh, smooth curves that uh, uh, for which this condition holds. Uh, this is the determinant of uh, uh, a matrix whose first column is gamma the component, the second column is gamma. And uh, uh, I call a curve star shape is if this determinant is uh, never zero. So uh, gamma and its uh, uh, velocity vector are never parallel. Now, of course, the underlying group here is different, right? Because you have a determinant of a matrix and and, uh, and, and uh, the natural group action is the SL. Uh, well, if you think projectively, this is the space of uh, linear fractional transformation. Think of that. So um, we define this geometry as being center of fine geometry. That's the name used by geometer. And uh, this quantity here is the center of fine R. Now, if I restrict to curves whose are length uh, is uh, S, and so this quantity is one, my S will be now the length parameter. I can differentiate with respect to length parameter this uh, relation, and it will tell me that the acceleration is proportional to gamma. So there is going to be a function here that uh, uh, depends on S uh, that gives me this relation. So if, if uh, I were in a uh, uh, periodic setting, which I will get there very quickly, uh, this is a, a sort of Hill equation, right? And this P uh, is called the central fine curvature, and it's the determinant of gamma S, gamma SS. Now, uh, Again, uh, in this small case, we're in the plane, so we have uh, two generators of the invariants of the curve, the differential invariants, and these are uh, the uh, speed, really, which I now set equal to one, and the uh, curvature. So what did Pinkow do? Well, he said, okay, let me consider curves, which are star shape. They are now periodic. So you can think of them as maps from uh, the unit circle into R2. They are r length parameterized. I'm going to mod out by translation. So you call them unparameterized uh, star shape curve. And then notice that if you take the area form of uh, two r length preserving vector fields along the curve. So you imagine your manifold is the space of curves. Your points on the manifold, each point is a curve. And you're going to try to uh, create an evolution on this space by uh, defining a velocity field for each curve. And those are vector fields on your mind. Elements, if you wish, of the tangent space. So <laughs> the integrated area form uh, turns out to be a symplectic structure. So this is a symplectic form, a two form, which is closed on the generator. And uh, uh, a way of doing Hamiltonian mechanics in general setting is if you have a symplectic form, you can associate vector fields, Hamiltonian vector fields, to smooth functions on your manifold. So take uh, a very obvious smooth function. This is the total curvature of your curve. And uh, what you're going to get is the so called pink curve. Uh, you use this correspondence. It's actually an easy exercise, a couple of lines. You want to find the vector field whose uh, Hamiltonian is the total curvature. So you use this correspondence and you are going to get this one. By the way, P is the only relevant one because this coefficient of gamma is dictated by arc length preservation. And if you look at the evolution of P, that's the key. So KDB equation arises as a uh, uh, as related to uh, a pretty simple evolution equation in center of fine geometry in the plane. Okay, so I, I'm ready to give you a little more general definition of moving frame. So what is a moving frame? It's simply a map into the underlying group of symmetry, even let's say a curve. Uh, you are lifting the curve to a frame. You're going from curve to frame, 
in a way that it's uh, uh, invariant under the same group function. So we call it equivalent here. Uh, when I say jet space, uh, what do we do in differential geometry when you construct a frame, say frame a frame, you keep differentiating the curve, right? Gamma sub x, gamma sub xs, gamma sub, and then you notice that it closes at some point because of the dimension of the space. So uh, every frame is determined really by differentiation. Now, uh, I'm going back to that question, how do we introduce uh, the spectral parameter? This is one of several ways. There is no uh, really good way, no really general theory of how you produce a spectral parameter. But what you do sometimes is a normalization. So you can normalize your uh, frame, you do a lift, uh, but you normalize it at a certain point, like uh, a normalization like this. This means the action of G on your curve. So for example, this kind of uh, normalization is going to give you a uh, moving frame. When I call left or right uh, moving frame, it really depends on the form of the frame equation. So, so skip a little bit this left or right, I just assume uh, I'm just building a frame uh, corresponding to the Okay, and now we have the same game. Uh, here is the uh, frame equation uh, up here. So in some sense, it's the equivalent to the frame equations in central prime geometry. The matrix defining these all these is called moral Cantal matrix. And now this, it encodes the differential invariance. Uh, if I didn't have a unique speed, there would be uh, a speed uh, function. Uh, in this matrix. Now, if you are joined this evolution equation, require compatibility condition, you are going to get a equation. So again, uh, you are recovering uh, integrable PD and your simple proof in R2, in the central fine setting, is the geometric realization of uh, K. All right. <laughs> now, um, I need the last couple of slides. Uh, they might be over technical, but uh, I would like to just give you an idea of uh, what uh, we do uh, when we study the Hamiltonian structure of this sort of uh, geometry. So this is fairly well known. Um, if you have uh, a V algebra uh, like SL2, uh, and it's dual, which can be identified with that. Um, you can actually write uh, compatible Poisson structures uh, on the maps from the circle into the Lie algebra, really the dual of it. But in this setting, it's still SL2. This is called the loop algebra of uh, SU2. Uh, this L uh, is a point on this loop algebra, and uh, this uh, ratio derivatives, in some sense, think of them as the gradients of certain Hamilton. Now, um, it's a sort of universal pair. It was introduced by Greenfield and Sokolov. And the main point we did in our work is that uh, uh, the, uh, this set on more Cartan equations live naturally on a certain quotient space. And we can reduce those universal brackets to the quotient space to give Hamiltonian and bi Hamiltonian pairs on the space of those, on the manifold of those. So if you do that, you go to moving frames again. So uh, here is. My moving frame at lambda equals zero. I set the spectral parameter uh, at zero for this purpose. I don't even set the gamma gamma prime, the determinant equal to one. So notice this more Cartan equation now encodes uh, the curvature and the outlet. And it can be thought to be as a point, as an element in this quotient space, the loop algebra of SL2, quotient by a certain uh, uh, subgroup. Uh, that acts with a certain gauge option. Again, don't worry about this. Just keep in mind that we can reduce the, those universal brackets to the function. 
If we do that uh, and we reduce the Gelfand, uh, the, the, the uh, Sokolov uh, and Brimfeld uh, Poisson brackets, uh, no surprise, uh, we are going to get the first and second Poisson operation for the field. So in that sense, again, there is a preservation of uh, biomilconian structure, which we can get geometrically from a master pair of uh, Poisson. Uh, a little more, you might ask, is there an azimotomer? Yes, of course, there is an azimotomer for this too, uh, azimotomer like map. And no surprise, it is the map that connects uh, the two uh, PDEs, the PDE that is pink tau flow and the PDE that is KDV. And all you do is you're mapping your curve to the curvature, the central point curvature. Uh, you can compute its differential following, you know, uh, the machinery of Langer and Perlin, and you notice uh, that the differential can be expressed in terms of uh, the uh, second Poisson operator for the KDV hierarchy, the easier one. Yeah. No, no, the second is, uh, no, 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 I'm sorry, the more complex one. It's the third order operator. Um, let me skip this and just give you uh, the gist of uh, uh, this discussion. So what we are saying here is that every flow in the KDV hierarchy is the curvature revolution that is induced by a geometric. So all the entire geometric hierarchy, uh, you can think, is a geometric realization of the KDV hierarchy uh, in the context of central point geometry, which by the way is totally equivalent to projecting geometry. Uh, moreover, the uh, so-called, let's call it as a map, but the, the map that takes uh, gamma to the central point curvature is a Poisson map. And this simply sends pink out area form, which is so much simpler, uh, into the second Poisson structure, KDV, which is so much more so, so we have again this simplification at the level of the geometry. All right. Um, some example. So you can take a break. <laughs> so let me just show you for for uh, for fun, really, uh, some uh, solutions of uh, pink output. And this is a genus two example. Uh, so again, remember this comes from uh, a solution of KDV. So we will have uh, uh, genus n. We will have uh, two n plus one branch points for KDV, right? Uh, notice uh, that uh, you can convince yourself that what is the next example is even easier, uh, that this is a star shaped curve, uh, that the position vector of your curve never uh, gets parallel to the velocity. Uh, the colors here depict uh, three uh, kinds, so darker to lighter, so it's kind of wobbles and rotates. Uh, but what's interesting is that if you follow a point of one of these curves, it, it actually does a very interesting uh, evolution. So mm -hmm. is the solution of the hyperfixation? Yeah, this is a solution of the uh, pink out uh, flow. Yeah. So it's really your curve in space. Uh, of course, you lose you lose where the group is, you only see picture of the curve evolving, but the underlying symmetry group, remember, is not Euclidean, is this SL. And you have uh, only conditions. Periodic, yeah. We're, we're, we are only looking at periodic pink curve result is for uh, close curves. Here is another, now you, you really see the star shape, right? So we've got total complex analysis. Star shape means uh, that's why it's called star shape. <laughs> the uh, gamma uh, and the gamma prime are never parallel. Again, this is a genus three, so seven branch points. Uh, we choose a certain vector frequency divisor, and uh, you're getting this fourfold symmetry uh, to the construction. Uh, these are uh, evolution of uh, from uh, dark to light, so out of the evolves again. Uh, and these are the more complicated evolution of uh, uh, 
single point tracked uh, along the evolving. So it's nice uh, to visualize uh, this from the point of view of geometry because not much is available uh, in this context. And how do yes. you get uh, the KDV solution? Oh. Yeah, they, they come from KDV solution. Or the KDV solution, but uh, the way you reconstruct the curve is true. In fact, uh, because the moving frame is essentially equivalent to your Schrodinger operator, you can reconstruct it from eigenfunctions uh, of the Schrodinger operator. But how can you get uh, uh, the solution, the KDV solution, uh, from the students? So, so the KDV solution, if you want the KDV solution, that's uh, simply the determinant of gamma sub x, gamma sub x. But we really start with the constructing final get eigenfunctions for the KDV. And we use this final get eigenfunction to reconstruct gamma because gamma is part of your frame. Now it's a kind of rather different setting from the DFE. The DFE, the frame was tangent normal by normal or your natural frame. Here, the curve is always part of your moving frame. And so it's in essence, your curve is comparable to an eigenfunction. So you, it's, it's kind of, you're going straight to the last pair to bypass the field. And then you can recover, of course, the solution of the PD by differentiation together. Yeah, so it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a nice clean feature. The construction is really the same. You're still constructing, uh, doing all of the moves towards constructing solution for KD. Right? But you stop with the other function and take an archives and you use that. And so these are actually the spin count for solution. All right, so um, I'm going to switch here, here because I would like to talk about more recent work by uh, Gloria and myself. And uh, uh, it took me a long time to get into this because I am not a discrete person and I found that discrete, discrete systems are extremely complicated and they're very hard to motivate sometimes. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about polygonal evolution. And, uh, uh, you know, one really, really simple example that you might have seen uh, is the so-called Volterra model. Uh, so uh, for now, just take it as uh, you have a, a variable Q, take it real, um, and uh, uh, it's indexed by M, so think of it on a lattice if you wish, uh, and uh, the evolution of Q sub M, uh, the velocity field, uh, is so simple. It's Q sub n times the difference between Q sub n plus one next site minus Q uh, at n minus one, previous side. This is known to be a discretization of the KVB equation. And by the way, it takes a lot of massaging to get the KVB equation because if you do a straightforward continuum approximation, you're only getting Q, Q sub X, you're only getting a zero <laughs> dispersion <laughs> limit of the KDB. But uh, uh, with various multiple scales, if you ask Suris, he will tell you, you'll get the KDB. But that's just an aside. Now, uh, it can be actually interpreted uh, as an evolution, it looks really trivial, of a polygon in the projective line. And uh, uh, that Q takes uh, an important interpretation is the so-called cross ratio of four points on the projective line, which is one, I believe it's the only uh, projective invariant of the quadruple points. And it, it goes way back to Euclid. Uh, so an interesting point. But that's just a, a, an interpretation. And then. So what I want to do here, is because this can be interpreted as a, an evolution of a polygon down in our field, I want to lift it up to the plane. So there is a way uh, to construct, uh, and that's easy, uh, uh, to construct a, a curve with two components and the affine coordinate will be your mu n uh, in, a, in, a, 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 in a patch on the uh, projective line. And uh, there is, in fact, a unique way of lifting to a polygon in R2 uh, under the condition uh, that oops, the determinant 
of gamma n first column, gamma n plus one second column is one for every n. So this is akin to uh, an arc length preservation, some sort. Again, notice the underlying group, no surprise, is SL2, linear fractional transformation. So SL2 action, projective action, are same. Um, when you do that, this quantity Q sub M is uh, recovered in this way. Uh, these are uh, two determinants, one of one is the determinant and that determinant. And if this is the evolution of Q, this will be the corresponding evolution of your curve in R. Uh, notice that aside from this factor, when you think of a continuum limit, this is just the tangential flow. And it's truly the tangential flow adjusted so that this vector field preserves our line conditions. So there is a very, very simple flow at the curve at the polygon level underlying this nonlinear looking flow at the curvature level. So again, we call this a projective realization of the Montana. Now, my context, like uh, the KDB, will be in the context of either closed polygons or polygons that close up to a, an element of uh, the projective group. And I call that monodromy. So you can you can think, you know, they don't quite close, they close up to multiplying by an element of the group. In uh, higher dimension, there is nothing uh, uh, more difficult in setting up uh, this sort of evolutions. So now you can think of having uh, a sequence of points in uh, Rn plus one, and you will be able to lift uh, the, you, you, you will interpret that as the lift of some polygon downstairs in the projective space of dimension F. Again, the lift is normalized so that uh, this quantity is one. Now, notice how, how uh, similar it is to think out uh, situation. You have gamma n, gamma n plus one, all the way to gamma n plus n. Now, instead of differentiating, you can't. What you do is you increment by one. You actually will have a gamma n plus one, dot, 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 gamma n plus n plus one. Uh, permute the position of gamma n plus n plus one here, subtract the two, and you're going to get that uh, gamma n plus n plus one has to be a linear combination of the previous vectors. Uh, with this coefficient here in front of gamma m, which tells me the number of hops, permutations, exchanges I have to do to move this in first position. Now I have a natural moving frame, and the natural moving frame is simply uh, taking these vectors here and packing them into a group L. So this will be in SL uh, M. I write down the discrete analog of the frame equations. And this is my more custom equations. And uh, there are theorems that say this completely encodes the invariance of the curve. So you will be able, from the knowledge of this, from this coefficient a n, to reconstruct your polygon up to a rigid motion, meaning an action of the loop. Nice, yes. periodicity in. The lattice. So what we are assuming is uh, that we call it twisted polygons. If you wish, assume periodicity, that's perfectly fine. Uh, if you want to be a tiny bit more general, assume that after some big N, uh, it doesn't come back to itself, but it comes back to U sub N times an element of the loop. So that's a one. Yeah, if I need some like that, yeah, it will yeah. work in that sense. So um, projective vector fields, now again, they are just linear combinations of the elements of your frame, like just the, as in Euclidean, in the Euclidean setting. Um, assume that you have one of those. Well, 
write down the corresponding flow, and then write down the induced flow on your frame. And remember, your frame is simply very simple, very simple, just this one. Okay. Uh, it will evolve by certain uh, matrix, you sub n, uh, impose compatibility conditions, and you're getting a uh, continuing time, discrete in space, uh, set of bodies. Arc length preservation requires Q sub n uh, as zero trace, and again, uh, compatibility and the uh, arc length preservation seems to be key to integrability. And here we are. Yes. Yes. The, exactly, exactly. So you do need that, and therefore, the, so you the, inherit naturally the trace zero so condition. So the all of us uh, on the sheet was in the two times the Yeah, yeah, that's, that's absolutely correct. So after all of this, uh, here is what we started with. Uh, so in 13, um, Gloria and Jim P. Wen, uh, we somewhere in this country. <laughs> uh, looked at this ODE system. Um, it's a, the vector field is a land preserving, so it's of the class I'm talking about. Um, and uh, uh, they look at that because the geometric invariants uh, solve this kind of uh, ODEs, which may be thought as generalization in some sense of the Volterra lattice. They call them a discretization of the Adler-Gelfman DQ flow. Uh, by the way, this generalized KDP equation was first introduced by Lux uh, and then was proven to be integral by uh, Adler-Gelfman DQ, who found compatible Hamiltonian structure, the so called HD bracket. Now, let me show you these uh, Poisson structures. Uh, the way these are obtained, by the way, is exactly as I told you for KDB. You realize these moral Cartan equations as living on an appropriate portion space, and you reduce uh, this universal uh, 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 of and Grimfeld uh, type uh, Poisson brackets to give a pair of reduced brackets. Now, they struggle for a long time to show that this pair forms a biomechanical pair, that is a compatible pair. And if you look at the expression there, or so uh, if you look at the uh, symplectic operators, this big tau here is the shift on one side, right? And the right shift. This R is actually a, 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 a non local term in some sense because you have a left shift, a deity, and the right shift. They succeeded in proving that uh, up to dimension two, meaning uh, polygons in R3, these two Poisson structure are compatible. But after that, uh, this gets uh, absolutely unwitting. So we came in and we said, uh, what if we lift the picture to the curve level? What do we get out of it? Is it going to be the simpler or what? So um, we introduced uh, two, uh, two forms, omega one and omega two, on the space of uh, polygons. And we did it in this way. So uh, in terms of a very simple one form, again, it's uh, written in terms of the ohms, it's written in terms of the terminals. Uh, the one form uh, uh, takes a, a arc length preserving vector field and gives you uh, its uh, quantity. Uh, the first two form is simply the differential of this one form. By the way, this operator, um, if you remember a slide back, if I plug gamma sub n in here, this is going to give me zero. Is that relation uh, 
when I told you increment by one and show that the gamma sub n plus n plus one is a, has to be a linear combination of the two components. And uh, this second form, a little more complicated, is some sort of the derivative uh, involved in the theta. Now, uh, we prove that these two are actually, uh, they are closed. They are closed to form on the space of our plane preserving vector fields. They have unfortunately non trivial kernel. They are small dimensional. We call them pre symplectic forms. They're not quite symplectic forms. So the uh, correspondence between Hamiltonians and vector fields is a strictly close. So um, the main result here is this that in fact we can, in some sense, invert uh, the uh, second. Uh, Symplectic form, omega 2, pre symplectic form. So, in other words, uh, we can write those uh, really ugly Poisson brackets in terms of uh, the two pre symplectic forms instantiated on certain vector fields. And these vector fields are the Hamiltonian vector field of a function on the space of polygons with respect to the WP symplectic form, in such a way that if gamma evolves by this so called Hamiltonian vector field, which are actually defined really on symplectic leaves, then the evolution of the invariance is Hamiltonian with respect to the force of speech. Now, what do I gain by this? Uh, the corollary is great. Uh, the two Hamiltonian structures now can be proven to be compatible in any dimension. And the proof is literally a three line equation. Because uh, what you do, uh, compatibility uh, means that any pencil uh, constructed, linear pencil constructed out of uh, those Poisson brackets is also Poisson. So if we want to show that uh, this guy is also a Poisson bracket, you just uh, uh, all you need, by the way, is Q symmetry uh, and other properties are, are obvious, but the bad uh, identity that the Gloria and GP couldn't uh, satisfy is the Jacobi identity. And if you write this for some brackets in terms of uh, your uh, synthetic form, uh, and it's a very simple calculation. Uh, what it boils down to is that the Jacobi identity is completely equivalent to the closure of the, the uh, symplectic form associated to the first structure. So that's another game. You lift everything to the level of the curve evolution, and some things become very, very simple. Now, where we left that was this. Uh, the, uh, uh, those pre symplectic structures have uh, uh, interesting kernels. Uh, the kernels of uh, omega one is generated essentially by translation uh, and by uh, some sort of second order uh, vector field. The Hamiltonians are actually fairly simple in terms of that uh, one form. Uh, but the kernel of omega two, when that in a sense is the reason uh, why uh, we, uh, in principle, could invert or could make a symplectic structure out of omega two. Is that the kernel is generated by the symmetries? Uh, the symmetries are the isotropy algebra that uh, G, that uh, uh, creates the twist, the monodrome. If that monodrome were uh, uh, were the identity, the situation would be much simpler because uh, they would group. Um, so we couldn't uh, prove uh, uh, that uh, uh, we couldn't construct integral hierarchy. We know that the two uh, structures are compatible. And uh, um, Gloria and uh, Anton is also have uh, made deep progress on that. And I think they have proof that you can uh, write down the entire integral hierarchy using a slightly uh, different type of form. Uh, now, um, a question that is left over for us is uh, what if we don't impose our claim to this uh, preservation? Um, it looks like we might still be able to get uh, uh, integrable hierarchies. So that uh, uh, 
sentence I said at the beginning that our plan conservation is key, um, it might not be key in all settings. So uh, let me thank you for uh, your attention and put up some references if people are interested. I was wondering what is fundamental about the nonlinear Schrodinger equation and the KDV that you can construct this connection with geometric flows? I mean, is it possible to extend it to other individuals? Yes, yes, it's not it's it's fundamental. fundamental. So we can yeah. find the uh, very interesting uh, dispersive PDEs. For example, in, in the last work, uh, we are looking at uh, um, evolution on uh, for Legendrian curves and transverse curves. And for transfer curve, we get uh, uh, the long wave short wave equation. Uh, sign Gorgon is a famous one, comes up uh, in the context of the spherical surfaces. So this connection is, is actually known way back in some sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it does show some sort of universal feature, like uh, um, those Poisson structure or symplectic structure, they seem to uh, come down to really simple uh, operations, like uh, the, the, the derivative with respect to our length and some sort of volume. Uh, so they keep popping up. And so I'm, I'm just wondering whether there is uh, something that is a bit more universal for all these systems. Um, if we look at central fine curves in, uh, uh, in, uh, in R3, I think it's one of the, it's down the Sigma paper in 2014, uh, those actually uh, are related to uh, the Dusinesk system in a very natural way. And it has a behavior that is very similar to the discrete setting. Uh, we get these pre-symplectic forms whose kernel seems to generate the hierarchy of flows. That is a double layer. So there are a lot of, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of, lot of improvement PDs are associated to geometry because there is a light sphere and the light sphere can be interpreted too. Thanks, Jim. Good question. Uh, yeah. How is it, is it related to in the, the indoor scattering? For those systems. How is it related to inverse scattering? So, in the sense, what, how you interpret geometrically the inverse scattering data? So, I, I tend to work in the context of periodic theory. So, um, the ingredients uh, that we use, right, the, 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 the frequency, the disciples, the divisor, and so on, uh, are associated to, to the geometry and sometimes the topology of this curves. It is not completely uh, uh, clear. Uh, one big question that we always have is uh, what's the role of the divisor? On geometry and topology. Uh, and I think that it should play a big role. But so far, you know, we're reconstructing this uh, solution, these finite gap solutions, fixing the divisor to be something very simple and very trivial. But I think the divisor should play a role. That's again one of the, these ingredients in the, the periodic theory. It should translate to norming constants in the, in the scattering in, in the traditional scattering. And it's probably less clear uh, uh, how to apply it to uh, short range uh, in your schedule. Uh, formally, you can call me as the reconstructing the curve, but uh, all this Hamiltonian structure is going to be much uh, a much bigger business, right? Because uh, uh, if you have uh, the space of closed uh, loops, right? Uh, there are ways of putting natural Hamiltonian structure. If you start having uh, maybe finite boundary condition, that's uh, that's more difficult. If you have uh, like uh, the classical, you know, rapidly decaying boundary condition, uh, Langer and Perlein worked out uh, a whole uh, Poisson structure for the vortex field equation on, on such spaces of curve. 
they, they have to make some assumption, uh, look at the space of so-called balance curves that are asymptotically linearly and they're balancing the way they, they go to infinity with respect to straight line. Uh, they, are, they are able to put a, 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 to a source structure on that kind of model. But it, yeah, I do not know that then if, you, if you have, say, either finite boundary condition or, or half line, uh, then I don't tell you what it's been. So probably I have a quick brief comment and then questions. The comment is that if you start with your Hasimov principle, you will realize that this is in fact the gauge transformation from the integral work equations of the lotus filament equation. After a change of value, it will become a fairly yeah. uh, metric. Uh, so, so that's why your Mamala Kaitan structure appears actually as the uh, equation that defines this with the gauge transformation. Um, this gauge transformation. This is no, it's not. It's not really the gauge transformation, right? Uh, so, um, <laughs> so you, you you may think of uh, the Eisenberg as an intermediate system. So you have the vortex filament equation. You have Eisenberg. You have uh, NLS. They are all connected by like Poisson maps, right? And so yeah, you differentiate. Yeah, uh, the gauge transformation in this case is uh, the your solution at, uh, at the different at, uh, fixed value of line. Exactly. And exactly. so the, this this satisfies exactly the model for penetration. You should do it because because you're gauging so you're you're gauging a, you're gauging a, a, a frame. And, right? uh, yes, and so the, the uh, NLS corresponds to what the uh, physicists call the and yeah. as a fellow Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you, you can see the, you know, you can, see, even when you construct uh, final gap solutions of the Eisenberg, right? Um, you you just think, okay, you instead of normalizing at infinity plus or minus, you normalize at the final point, right? And so you get this gauge. But, but it, it, what you're doing is essentially you are multiplying your moving frame by a different normalization an element of the group. Really so you are getting a different moving frame, but all moving frames will encode differential value. So they will have more of a time for friction. My question is uh, uh, if you have ever seen uh, any results related to as the model of information security in the systems, you know, related to octagonal symbol. Yes, that is important production. So if you will, I think if you Google that, uh, there is a... Uh, um, so I remember in the mid-90s, there was a work by Douglas and Gilfant, not certain surfaces and surfaces. And after this... Uh, yeah. yeah, I think that, that, that there are lots of people that are looking at, you know, uh, different... Myself. Different, yes, like the Google of and two SL groups in algebra. So, last operators are usually SL models. So, right. they're doing the SL algebra. If you go, if you, if you look for similar geometric results about integral systems and last operators, you can find the same results. Yeah, but the integral system is not really the integral system. It's more like the yeah, I mean, maybe we can discuss that later, but uh, I don't really work in that. Yes, right? But I, yeah, just uh, for someone who's interested in quantum mechanics, I'm just curious whether you're ever in connection with the linear shooting equation and the geometric part four. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm it comes up, uh, comes up uh, in KDV as the as the the spectral problem. So, but uh, as a as a as a team, uh, Thank you.
Please again. Next talk is Monday at 9 p.m. Freshman breakfast for life. Speaker is going to provide it. Provide it. It's going to be included. Uh, 